Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Elaine Swindon, Research Manager at the Center of Excellence in Food Security. I firstly would like to extend a warm welcome to all attendees who is joining us in the last stretch of the UWC Research Week, which is focusing on UW's contribution to the 2030 SDG agenda. Once again, thank you very much for taking time out of your very busy schedules to join us. This session will be driven by colleagues of Economic and Management Sciences at UWC. Their presentations this afternoon will feed directly into the goals of the SDG, which concentrates on no poverty, peace, justice, and strong institutions, sustainable cities and communities, clean water and sanitation and industry, as well as innovation and infrastructure. Considering that we have a packed session of about seven presentations and our time is limited, I want to ask you to please put your questions and comments in the chat box, which will be addressed at, the each, of, at each uh, presentation, at the end of each presentation. With any further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the afternoon, Jaco Janssen van Vieren. Um, Jaco, I'm giving over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Elaine. Um, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity to share my research with you. Um, I've time for 15 minutes um, just to 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 inform you not 20 minutes as initially uh, thought so um where did this all start uh, on that note i also need to mention and highlight that this research was done under the uh, stalamos university when i was doing my masters um but professor patar when i did inform him about it was and I sincerely want to thank you for that, Professor Patel, um, for the openness. I think there is a great need for collaboration between departments, between the universities in the, in, in the Western Cape. And I think this specific theme is, 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 is one of those themes. So thank you for presenting the um, research, even though at that time it was conducted under the University of Stellenbosch. I'm going to, put, to share my screen with you to start the presentation. Definitely do not judge the colors um, and think that the credibility is lowered because it is aesthetically looks more in line with what people at school would uh, enjoy. There's a purpose to that. Um, So this began, um, so the question is, how can, we, how can we conduct research that is based in societal needs, but still methodolog methodologically competitive? I so often see, and ever since I started studying um, this, in this field, from my very first year, I, I saw a lot of research that is completely outdated on themes, typical themes that are studied in corporate and in consulting that are, that South African universities are often even unaware that, that this kind of research is already a decade in front in, 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 in Ivy League universities or other universities, typical studies around job engagement, et cetera, et cetera, and personality. Those are very important themes and topics, but I saw none of my peers really looking into research that is grounded in our most perplexing problems here in, in South Africa. So one day I approached Professor Kali Tron, who's, who planted the seed for this research and who's today still one of my closest mentors and friends. And I, and I said, Professor Tron, what, what can I do when I exit here to, to help break from this sort of stream? What can we do? And, I, and he said, Yaku, you, well, tomorrow's lecture is all about this and i'll show you why so he planted and i want to tribute to give tribute to him and thanks to him that he planted the seed this really stems from um the tragedy and of of the history of our country when it comes to 
education. And the fact that we have statistically a bimodal school system, functionally, we have a still until today, almost 30 years after the start of the democracy, we have poor to dysfunctional government schools primarily, primarily. And then we have on the other side of, of the distribution, high quality old Model C or private schools with very little in between. Okay. The effects of this is profound. And um, the research for social economic policy team at Stellenbosch University under leadership of Professor Sarfas van der Berg and some very talented researchers have really pulled up this, rolled up their sleeves to do a lot of work in, in the years since they started to inform other disciplines um, surrounding this. This is also just, again, a slide that highlights the picture and a very limited few talented or extremely motivated or lucky students managed to escape from low quality schools and enter um, higher income and higher skilled jobs. I very often, when I read the news, I think about all the problems and how little, you know, small parts maybe our field can play, but at least it's one part. So what would that part be? And, and this is also what this, this study um, is about even though it's a very small little, little piece of tinder that can hopefully create a flame. Um, but predominantly, this is still the picture. This study was also part of the, um, the research teams at Recepts um, with, this is by Moses and, and Van der Berg, but the picture pretty much still looks the same in 2022. Also, just want to share with you before I delve into the study um, some thoughts that drove Kali when he when he when he when he thought about this, and it's a quote by Stephen Jay Good that says, "I am somehow less interested in the weight and convolutions of Einstein's brain than in the near certainty that people of equal talent have lived and died in cotton fields and sweatshops." Um, I derived from, you know, from, from Stephen J. Goods, I, I derived in what drove my own thoughts at that stage and still today is the fact that every time I drive past the townships um, outside of Cape Town, I think, well, I am somehow less interested in the memorabilia and the photos in Christian Barnard Hospital than the near certainty that people of equal talent may be playing soccer alongside the N2 of Cape Town. Um, I see this both in the research and in my personal observations, and I am very thankful for Christian Barnard, what he's done for this country, but I'm more interested in the fact that there are people of equal talent that are lost due to this massive gap in education growth. So the study uh, began by asking, you know, as one would ask in organizational psychology, because this is, you know, from the perspective of an organizational psychologist. Um, I just want to quickly drag with Zoom. There's always this, let me just drag this so that it's out of my way. So what is, what is the key then? You know, if, if it's not resources, we, we, we've been through this as a country and it's not pupil and, and pupil teacher ratios necessarily, that's the pivot point, what is it? Well. There is no doubt about it. It's it's leadership and management. Okay. Good school principals with a good team behind them. They work indirectly um, and they enable their schools or to either turn around struggling schools. There are a list of hundreds of examples in the Western Cape and nationally of school principals of diverse backgrounds that managed to have done this. But this beckoned the question, what would a successful school then look like? You can't study behavior without studying the performance construct. And although there's been a lot of research on this, um, my study did not delve into this as deeply as it did on the behavioral side. So predominantly the research question for me was, what are the 
bundles of behavior that when demonstrates demonstrated leads to success, uh, um, generally speaking, uh, in schools in South Africa. But we had to ask, what does a successful school look like? What does the basic performance outcomes of a school look like? And we did capture that also in the um, in, in the methodology, which I'm going to cover with you in the next few slides. I very often in practice also see the same mistake where researchers in applied setting or academic setting start um, studying a behavioral domain without look, taking into account the criterion, taking into account the performance side. Um, and um, it's, it's something that I very often see lacking in, in research. And then secondly, well, to, to lead the school towards that success, what would a successful school principle look like in terms of behavior, which is the research initiating really question that sets this, that set this re broad research project in motion is, you know, why is there a difference between school principles in terms of their ability to lead their schools to success? Statistically then, Later on, why is there variance in, in the extent to which they lead their schools to success? Um, so, as again, I don't want to make this study out as this big study that's changing the world. It is one study, but it has created uh, a spark. So we had to start qualitatively. Um, there is a lot still to be learned in terms of what constitutes performance in terms of behavior for school principals internationally, but even more so nationally. Um, so we started with a qualitative approach that would, that is designed in such a nature that it can hand over the relay stick to a explanatory quantitative study after the development of measurement instruments, which we in the meantime have done and is busy being validated by a, a student called Michelle Karsten. Um, we used the critical uh, incident technique initially um, with a diverse sample of, of 10 school principals that were regarded as subject matter experts that are from a diverse um, settings from diverse levels of school wealth um, and also demographically just a diverse group. Um, and we then used um, the critical incident technique and coding I have a lot of detail available for you, um, ladies and gentlemen, that you can visit if you want to know more about the method we used. Um, and you're very welcome to, and I will send it to you, but I don't want to spend too much time. The, 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 the one thing I want to highlight is that it's important, I think, in, in, a, in a behavioral, in an applied behavioral science to be able to set up a qualitative study so that, so that the relay stick can be handed over to to quantitative studies that can measure these competencies um, that we have identified and that it's a practicable, practicable study. So what was the results? So we've used structured interviews, as I said. Um, first, we had to um, find out what does a successful school look like? In other words, what are the um, school performance outcomes? Well, it was uh, curricular achievement, quality of instruction, um, professional capacity of schools, pupil engagement, wealth of school resources was also there, a student-centered learning climate, poor school processes, parent and community involvement, and pupil educational readiness. I'm just timing myself now, Melody, as well, but can you just give me an indication where I lie now? I've, I've lost my... Yeah, it, it's quarter past one now. You have two minutes left. Okay. So these are the outcomes. We didn't focus too much on this, but this constitutes performance. Um, and we use this then to move over to the behavioral domain, which was really the real focus of our study. So the, these are the competencies that we've come to now that the results um, culminated in. It's the formulation of a school vision and setting strategic direction, um, planning school goals and establishing the expectations, 
Very importantly, the ability to resource strategically according to goals that are aligned to teaching and learning. The development of school staff, both formally and informally. The ability to maintain an orderly and supportive learning environment. The ability to lead across school boundaries, managing and rewarding teaching and learning, leading with compassion, um, strong communication and influencing uh, competencies, and the ability to manage oneself and make effective decisions. These competencies then were allocated different levels of frequencies uh, in the findings. It did not, of course, highlight the importance necessarily of it, but it is indicative of how often it was brought forth by the subject matter experts. The way forward, I think, is, is important. Um, this is a model that I've constructed from work by SHL um, to encompass the whole performance sort of um, picture. Um, and a lot of research is still needed in terms of the situational um, factors, things like the unions, things like culture, um, leadership potential is the psychological dispositions that lead to these behaviors. I have seen no research in South Africa on that. My study focused on number two there, the leadership behaviors, and to some extent, number one. But we need to collaborate um, between the universities and, and distribute, I think, this in, 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 and, and not have overlap. Um, in order to create something that we can put on the table for policy to inform the promotion. And that will determine the impact that we can actually have. Um, there's a list of a whole list of other um, of other references that you would that I would be happy to send you. Um, that's it from from my side. Thank you, Mr. Van Vieren, for a very, very insightful presentation. I'm just looking if there's any questions, if there's any comments from our attendees. Uh, Melanie, I don't see any. I just need to Melanie. mention, so, no. You can one, one thing I just need to mention, so in, in a PhD, Dr. Gabrielle Wolf has found no correlation between what is currently being used as predictors of school principal success in the appointment and promotion process and actual academic outcomes or other performance outcomes. Okay. So many women are skipped for promotion because of um, human bias and cultural bias. Um, and this is a massive problem that I've, and I've seen no indication of, of a change, even though competency-based assessment has been put forth as something that's needed. Mr. Van Fieden, I just want to ask whether you think... Uh, Sorry, Dr. Sinden, we have Aiden Cleofas, who has a question. Um, yes, I don't Aiden. actually have a question. I, sorry. Um, the, uh, the chat has been disabled for everybody. So we can't actually ask questions right. in the chat. That would probably be on the host. Pardon me, if I can just Pardon read, me, if I can the questions and comments needs to go in the Q&A box, please. Okay, can you explain where the Q&A box? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> You're <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Apologies for that. We will wait for your question or... Okay, I haven't seen any questions. Yeah, I didn't have a question. Yeah. I just had a comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Melody, I don't see the comment. Um, no, she... Doctor, no, she, she verbally commented regarding the oh. chat box. So that's fine. If Dr. Van Fieren can kindly and stop share, please. I'm also not a doctor in academic titles, uh, just a note, but that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think we can move ahead. Um, our next presenter will be Dr. Namshla Mashandla, which is a senior lecturer in African politics and international relations in the political studies department at UWC. 
Welcome, Dr. Mashanda, and I'm giving over to you. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm trying to share, okay, now I can share. Okay, um, so my presentation today is on political identities and migration, um, assessing forms of belonging among Ethiopian immigrants in Cape Town. So this presentation is based on an ongoing project um, that recently took off um, about a month or two ago. Um, but the conceptualization of the project has been ongoing for a couple of months, um, since last year, at least. Um, so the research proposal itself has gone through um, various um, reviews. Um, so we were able to finally take off with the project um, in September. So a bit of background about um, the project. So migration is a highly political topic um, in many societies across the world. And it cuts across various um, disciplines, um, topics. Um, so it lends itself quite nicely to interdisciplinarity. And my particular project is an interdisciplinary study of the political identities of Ethiopian immigrants in Cape Town. Now, this research came about, of course, um, based on a review of the literature, of current literature, and on the current status of knowledge on this particular topic, um, especially in the South African context. And in that process, um, it became clear that um, this topic is very uh, important and um, uh, um, quite uh, uh, necessary in South Africa. However, there are key topics that tend to dominate um, the analysis. Um, for example, the issue of xenophobia um, tends to, to dominate analysis. Um, issues of development, the development discourses, um, issues of remittances um, from um, host countries to uh, uh, sending countries, issues of entrepreneurship and how immigrants survive economically. So there isn't much about political questions, um, uh, political questions which have implications for both um, the immigrants and the nation states that are involved, whether it be the countries of origin or the host countries. And this is especially the case when it comes to intra-African migration. Um, you find that political questions are more often raised when it comes to Africa-Europe um, migration patterns. And this we hear more about um, uh, and we see more about when we see Africans um, embarking on desperate journeys across the Mediterranean to Europe. Um, however, um, there is more movement uh, um, happening on the continent. A lot of Africans are moving within Africa. Um, and so we need to um, expand our understanding and knowledge of intra-African migration even more. Um, in terms of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, I situate this research within um, the SDG 16. As mentioned previously, migration is a cross-cutting issue um, that encompasses various topics and themes like poverty, education, climate change, etc. cetera. Um, however, SDG 16 in particular speaks to issues of peace, justice, and strong institutions, um, and talks about promoting peaceful and inclusive societies and uh, promoting people-centered governance. So this is where I locate this particular um, research. 
there is a need to understand the implications of migration on the political identities of migrants. This has implications for the nation states and formal politics in general. So it means that if more and more people are moving, um, if there is increased mobility, um, especially within the continent, there will be some kind of transformation that takes place in terms of um, our traditional um, understanding of political identities, but also of political structures and, and institutions. The political identities of immigrants um, can, can definitely relate to peace and justice as well as inclusive society. Uh, societies, when we think that, um, when we consider that there are push and pull factors um, that are quite wide ranging that, that enable this movement, um, um, this, this, this migration and this mobility, um, some of which um, could be resolved with um, political stability. So this is where I locate my research as far as the SDGs are concerned. Um, in terms of the theories that are um, underpinning the study, um, I'm considering two approaches, um, transnationalism as well as long distance nationalism. Now, transnationalism is a process by which immigrants um, forge and sustain um, their identities um, in simultaneously um, across different um, 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 spatial locations. Um, and the reason why I chose these two theories is really to interrogate the idea of being uprooted and being assimilated. Because migration is not a, a clear cut process. Um, so these traditional understandings of migration and mobility that um, individuals or migrants are uprooted from their homes um, or that they get assimilated in their host communities um, simplifies migration. Um, and so transnationalism and transnational identities and long distance nationalism, they, they kind of challenge and push back against those traditional understandings. In terms of methodological approach, um, the study is an ethnographic case study um, that is using semi-structured um, and focus group interviews. And the main question that is really um, dominating this, this study beyond what we are asking our research participants is, who is a migrant in Africa today? And what does this mean in terms of national belonging? So this is a big question um, that this research will hopefully feed into um, in one way or the other. And this is a question that has not been um, sufficiently asked. We think we know the answer, um, but there, there hasn't been enough evidence to suggest um, uh, what this means, uh, who is an, a, a migrant in Africa today. And this is part of the, of the idea of challenging the, the, the state-centric um, views of migration, um, to challenge the idea, um, the, the nation-state view of spatial mobility, that is um, migration is movement from nation-state A to nation-state B that it is more complex than that. Um, it is not about being uprooted. Um, it is not about being assimilated. Um, so we're trying to understand um, those complexities and those nuances that exist um, in this movement. Um, this nation state view of, of mobility lends itself to what has been called methodological nationalism, 
um, in the studies about migrants and, and who they are. And methodological nationalism um, can lead to um, the framing of migrants as being problematic, um, cate being categorized as a, a certain um, uh, group of people, um, a, a different than other um, within the nation state. And, and they can be seen as a problem that needs to be addressed. So this is the nation state understanding of, of migration, um, which this research, our research is trying to, um, to challenge. So we need to hear more from the migrants themselves and how they understand um, their migrant experiences. How do they identify um, themselves? And so, as such, we, we see migration as needing to be seen and analyzed from a variety of perspectives um, and to move away from the state-centric approaches. So the dominant approach, uh, methodological approach is ethnography. And within ethnography, there's different ways that you can um, approach um, the research. And for this particular study, uh, we are focusing on lived simultaneity and performance. And we are trying to observe how migrants um, experience these um, simultaneity, uh, being the incorporation of migrants in social fields that extend into the new land um, and transnationally through networks. Um, so it, it, it's really complicating the migrant experience um, um, as well as performance, uh, which refers to a realm of cultural practices in which people envision and create various aesthetic expressive um, and symbolic um, uh, expressions and testing them and revising them. Um, so we're looking at these two lived simultaneity and performance of identity claims and practices. Performance stresses the agency um, of subjects um, and the active social construction of their world. Um, and, and, and to do this, we are using semi-structured interviews, observations, and, and, and focus group interviews to gather how Ethiopians perform um, some of, 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 of their identity claims uh, uh, in private and in public rituals. And the reason we're focusing on these two approaches is because the, the, it, it is clear that um, migrants exist in multiple social fields. They exist in multiple social locations. Um, and, and, and so we want to try and, to understand and unpack how they construct their identities within this um, multiple social fields. And so, as I've mentioned, that this uh, the research, the field research itself, is um, relatively um, recent, um, and so we can only present preliminary findings um, at this particular time. And one of the key findings that emerge is that Ethiopian immigrants in Cape Town are not a homogenous group; um, they they are quite diverse. Um, and so this will, will be quite interesting. Um, we're not quite sure yet where it's going to lead us, uh, but it's an interesting observation so far that um, we are not talking to a homogenous group of immigrants that are coming from the same country. Um, and some of the uh, categories um, that we found um, include different um, economic um, categories, um, different educational levels, um, different religions. Uh, we've got Christian Orthodox Ethiopians, we've got Muslim Ethiopians, 
and we've got evangelical um, Ethiopians. And so this diversity um, is expected to determine how they invoke their different cultural practices and their claims of national identity. Um, we're not quite sure how yet, but- um, Makshanda, Makshanda, sorry, uh, you have two minutes left. All right, thanks. Um, and there's no clear cut political motivations for migration, um, even though there are serious political crises in the country, such as the war that started in November, 2020. However, our research participants, most of them um, came before 2020 and um, have been residents um, in Cape Town or South Africa for more than five years. And there's no clear distinction in observance of private and public cultural rituals and this tend to be collapsed. Um, and um, because the Ethiopians tend to move um, in, in the same circles. Um, so public for them is mostly within the Ethiopian, the broader Ethiopian community um, in Cape Town uh, and private would refer more to, um, to, to, to single households. Um, at the moment, it appears that there's more transnationalism than long distance nationalism in terms of um, the expression of national identity. And um, to conclude, migration is a cross-cutting cross issue that is located in several UN SDGs and our research speaks specifically to political questions. Um, and this research seeks to highlight the fact that there is a need to diversify the lenses through which we investigate intra-African migration and to raise more political questions um, in terms of understanding this increased um, mobility within the continent. So I think I will end there, Chair, um, in terms of meeting the time limits. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mashanda. Uh, okay, I see you stop sharing. I see we have one question from Zamatungwa Mblezi. With increased migration, we've seen increased intolerance from host countries. What are some of the complexities in forming this response? May you answer? Mm. Yeah. Um, that's a, a, a good question, um, and it's, it's a very pertinent question. Um, I, I think it's a lack of understanding, um, really, the, the, what is behind migration. Um, um, and of course, I mean, I think the, 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 the most um, clear answer to this, uh, what appears to be the, the clearest answer is competition for resources. Um, there is dire economic conditions um, within the host countries, um, especially if we're talking Africa specifically. Um, if we take South Africa, for, for example, um, you know, the, the standard of living for, for, for locals, um, is 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 not um, a very um, uh, um, promising, um, and so if you have immigrants um, coming to compete um, with the locals for scarce resources, then um, um, the tensions um, rise, and and it breeds into intolerance. Um, so that is one. Um, reason for this uh, increasing intolerance, but it's more than that. It's a uh, lack of understanding, lack of information. Um, there's also no um, real political commitment to address um, the, 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 the changing society because of migration. Um, so those are some of the things um, to consider. Thank you. I see we have another question from Lutasha Ndisi. In your experience of having conducted this research, are migrants' national identity compromised? 
Um, I mean, it will depend uh, by what you mean by compromised. Um, it, it depends on the individual migrant. Um, if um, a migrant holds their national identity um, dearly, um, then the movement um, to um, a different um, country to a different national space, then it might be seen as being compromised. Um, their national identity could be seen as compromised. Um, but however, others um, embrace um, um, this uh, transnationalism. Um, it becomes a, a factor, it becomes a fact of life um, for them. So it depends on the individual um, um, migrant and, and their own um, views and, and, and how they um, interpret their national identity. Mm. Thank you. Thank you once again, Dr. Mashanda, for a very invaluable presentation. And thank you for giving us your time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you. Without further ado, colleagues and attendees, we're going to move to Professor Greg Reiters, which I know personally, and which is a professor currently at the School of Government. Professor Reiters, you may go away. Thank you. Good afternoon, colleagues. I'm just getting my presentation together and I will put my screen, my video on now. Is everybody able to see the screen? Yes, we can, Prof. You can just put it in slideshow. Slideshow, thank you. So, <clears throat> So this is a bit of research that I did with a, a PhD student, Denise, uh, and a master's student, Felicia. Uh, and the title is Turning a Blind Eye to African Refugees. And I'm so glad that I'm, the previous speaker, um, you know, uh, touched on a lot of the broader issues of, you know, transnationalism, identity, because the topic I'm looking at is more a case study of, um, of, of government and the role of government in actually not taking responsibility for um, what's going on. I think government's a very big player um, because obviously they have resources, they have policies. So let me quickly go through it. Um, I'm trying to go down a page, hopefully it's gonna go. So there's Cape Town, uh, it's regarded as a world city. Um, what you see and what you don't see, that becomes an issue. The tourist image versus the Cape Flats, the biggest uh, informal settlements in the country, uh, poverty, etc. cetera. Um, you know, the places where a lot of us come from. And we don't come from Camps Bay and we don't, often this is a, another Cape Town that we don't often experience because we live somewhere else. Places like <coughs> Kayanicha, Manenberg. And the issue of, of, of conflict, I think the previous speaker picked up on some of the dimensions of it. Um, it's huge. Uh, people are losing their lives. This has been going on since uh, the early 90s when we had <clears throat> Dr. Butalesi, when he was um, acting as, as president of the country, started with the xenophobic kind of rhetoric. So politicians, Government officials play a big role in stirring up this rhetoric of, you know, Africans, uh, Malawians go home, etc. Now, the theory that I'm drawing on <clears throat> is a paradoxical theory because when we study policy, and I work with a lot of the school of government, we do policy analysis, and when we when we look at policy, we we're thinking about what government does to solve problems and what sort of decisions they make about resources. So policy typically in conventional terms is about something you can see, the government's identify the problem, they make decisions, they allocate resources. What we've done in this uh, research is to flip the narrative by saying, let's not look at decisions, rather let's look at non-decisions. 
And policy is actually about both decisions and non-decisions, both about action and inaction. And so the title of our study is actually about something that the government doesn't want to deal with. And it's, so it's a decision they've made not to take a decision. In other words, not to deal with an issue. Um, and so there are so many variations of this uh, kind of inaction or what we called in, in the study blame shifting, turning a blind eye. Uh, you know, you can say, okay, um, we've got this issue, but let's not deal with it now. So there's an, uh, one typical state response, you know. Uh, it's too complex, let's do further studies. Uh, we don't really understand the nature of the problem. Let's have a commission of inquiry. Or let's not even accept that we are responsible primarily for this issue or that we have some role to play in the issue. Let's say that it's, it belongs somewhere else, that migration isn't our problem. You know, Let's go to Malawi and find out why are the people who live in Malawi, why are they live in Nigeria? It's not our issue. Those people must sort things out. So that's really the theme that we want to look at. It's the politics of inaction, the politics of non-decision. And so um, I just want to give you a very quick kind of factual background. Uh, Cape Town in 2016 had 300,000 migrants from other provinces and 100,000 international migrants, of which 17% were from Europe and the rest were, Af were from Africa. Um, those people who come from, from the rest of Africa, from beyond the Limpopo, are generally more qualified, uh, more uh, likely to get jobs. So the rate of employment there is 78% compared to a much lower rate for South African um, black workers. So there's a big issue there. About how is it that, you know, is it because they're more skilled and so on? But that's another research topic. The second relevant background factor is that Cape Town uh, is, is, is in a lot of senses a world city. Uh, it's become a major tourist attraction. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world. A lot of people come here, but also um, there's a paradox that you get all these foreign tourists, but you also have a large number of foreign black workers who are actually forming the, if you like, uh, a kind of labor force to help service these foreign people that come here to have fun. So some people come here to have fun, other people come here to work and do other things. What's shocking though, is that Cape Town, and this is our main, one of our findings, is never really made the effort to develop, the city has never made an effort to develop explicit policies or programs or put aside substantial funding to deal with this issue. Uh, we also find that in Cape Town, well, this is the case in other cities as well, you will find that uh, African immigrants are used as labor you know, they do, they perform work, they're purely seen as instruments and as a means, as a resource. Um, they're not regarded as potential citizens. Um, the fact that we're using all of their fantastic artwork, all their knowledges that stretches back for centuries, this century old civilization and culture that they bring here is not acknowledged. We're just, in other words, stealing culture. And we don't acknowledge this. There's no recognition of how they actually add to the city. And so my, the paper that we wrote concludes that actually Cape Town is closest to the issue and something needs to be done. And the politics of turning a blind eye and of inaction is something that's gonna come back to bite us in a very bad way. And so the, 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 the theory we're drawing on, as I said, is uh, you know, policy silences, the, the politics of inaction, leadership in a city and the role of local government. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, we know that people have been killed in Cape Town. Um, Somalis in particular are being murdered, uh, in, runs into the hundreds. In 2008, we had a major uh, epidemic of violence um, in May and in Cape Town alone, some 30,000 people were displaced into to the living tents for several weeks. And um, we also know that even despite all of this, the last 10, 15 years, Cape Town is uh, a very um, attractive place. So of course, real estate has gone up, property goes up all the time. Um, and we know that uh, over time, 
you know, if you look at 1994 to now, it's been a big shift where foreign workers are more visible in the city. Uh, you get into an Uber, you can do, you know, probably have a conversation about Zimbabwe because the driver is going to be from Zimbabwe. You go to a restaurant, go to a market, uh, you know, you're going, to, you're going to see. So it's a very visible presence. And this is part of the reason why, um, you know, we can argue that the success of the city and the profitability of tourism and the industries, the service industries built around it, have a large or in large measure um, linked to the presence of foreign migrants and the work that they perform in constructing the city. So the issue here that I and my fellow um, authors had to face was how do you study something that didn't happen? If in action or um, you know, failure to, to do something, not make a decision, is what you study and how do you study that? So we had to kind of work out, uh, you know, what are going to be our, you know, how do we proceed? And so one of the things we did was to look at um, all of the documents that we could find, you know, the tourism documents, the IDPs, you know, the um, vulnerable groups policy, the social development strategy, responsible tourism. We went through all of those documents. And in the one instance, we found a draft report um, in, in the social development strategy. We found a draft where migrant, uh, foreign African migrants were included, included in the document and later taken out. So that was a bit of a, an interesting finding that somewhere there was some decision that we shouldn't include them. So if you look at all these documents and these policies, you'll find there's no reference or very, very indirect reference to um, you know, foreign, foreign migrant workers and their families. They are not defined as vulnerable groups at all, despite the fact that they are the object of incredible violence, uh, periodic and even everyday violence, uh, because people have to live with this and, and, and cope with it and so on. Um, we also found it was necessary in our research to look at the social structure and the structure of vested interest in the city because somebody clearly is, there are decisions that have been made, we just don't know where these decisions have been made. Are they been made in dark rooms? You know, but some are the structure of the city and the structure of vested interests. Powerful people and players, you know, like your wealthy ratepayers associations, the tourist bodies, the people who run these things called CCIDs, which are these central city um, sort of um, securitized districts. Uh, all of this begins to suggest that there's some sort of structure um, that's operating that's not visible to us at all and that we need to have a handle on that. We also use some of the literature, some excellent um, scholarly work by a number of uh, scholars that begin to sort of pick away at the structural uh, you know, set up in Cape Town and how this could lend itself to silences and deflections around policy that that should be looking at vulnerable people. We did field work. We did 28 face-to-face -face interviews um, with city officials. We spoke to NGOs. We spoke to individual migrants, the organizations, asylum seekers, and, and street traders. And, and we also began to form an impression that the city really was not interested. We looked at the budget sorry, and again. Prof, sorry? Have, sorry, Prof, you have about two minutes left. Okay. So we discovered then that, uh, I'll give you three quick examples. The first, the strategy we discovered of, of blame shifting was to say, look, it's not our problem. It's the problem of the national government. The second one, which Alan Ziller uh, kind of epitomized in 2008, was to say, look, this is not our issue. This is an international issue. And, you know, the United Nations needs to get involved. Besides, she said, this is taking away money from other projects, 170 million. Councillor J.P. Smith, who was head of security and safety, made a similar, uh, that this is really irritating. We can't, every time people are attacked, we have to house and feed them. It's costing us 147 million. The Chamber of Commerce said the same thing. We must get the African Union involved. This is not our problem. So in action then has been the dominant feature of the state response at, at the level of the city. 
and uh, it can be again we can argue it out in so many different ways the budget the law when she was the mayor donated a measly 21,000 to an NGO and she made a big uh, you know, deal on in, in the news but clearly that's not going to make a difference at all 21,000 won't get you very far in conclusion um, we need to take very seriously the issue of political will and leadership in the city. We need a comprehensive response that takes seriously the kind of issues of working class people, including foreign uh, workers. Um, we need to include um, migrant workers and their organizations in policy dialogues and in planning for the future of our city. Um, we need to have decent work for all and that such policies need to be enforced. We need creative spaces where we can, through public art and so on, we, we can interact as, as, a, as an involving citizenry. Because I think that people who come and build the city, whether they come from Malawi or Nigeria, are also potential citizens and they shouldn't be seen as temporary people that we just use. Democracy in the end is about our values, not just about getting votes, which unfortunately that is the game. As Cheryl Africa has written uh, very articulately about toxic electoral campaigns that winning elections is more is, is, is the main game and this shouldn't uh, be at the expense of our values and our human rights uh, kind of orientation. Of course we can look at the bigger pan-African partnership um, but finally we need to think about what is the city that we want to live in and we want our children to live in. The best cities according to Jane Jacobs are open innovative not fortified enclaves. They are not inward looking. If cities emblematize innovation and human achievement, what is it that we want as citizens of Cape Town? So I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Prof, for a very, very insightful presentation. I don't see any questions or comments, but may I ask, you mentioned that there is a lack of policies and programs in the city obviously to address this issue. Uh, from your experience, do you think there is a will at the city to put these policies and programs in place from your interaction with the city? Um, unfortunately, there, there, there aren't any clear indications you know, of, that, of, of that will, but I think there are many citizens movements and there's a lot of activity. Even at UWC, you know, we encourage activities to, to raise public awareness. And I think it's beholden, beholden of citizens and, and people who are aware of these issues to begin to develop uh, and play a more you know, active role in defining what we mean by the city. Um, mm. I think governments unfortunately are, as you've seen all over with our coalitions that are collapsing, they, every vote counts. You know, if you're in power in Ekuruleni, you know, it's about how many, it's about those extra 20 votes you didn't get. So vote counting, chasing votes has become the issue and it's an unfortunate reality that we have and it's the political will therefore to deal with these kind of social issues, these civic issues, these cultural issues, this quality of life that we all want to enjoy in an open city. These issues are increasingly being put on the back burner. So I think it's for civil society, you know, all of us to, to begin to grab hold of this issue and say, this is what we want. We want citizen, a citizen movement that can reclaim uh, the this, this city and reshape the city and ensure that the city belongs to all those, not only who live in it, but also those who work in it. The people who lie on the beaches and enjoy the city and the other people who do the work. Surely city should also belong to the people who work in it. And it's a different kind of epistemology. It's a different kind of way of understanding uh, what makes a city, you know. Uh, and so I think the people who labor, who build cities, need to be put into the forefront. So trade unions could come into the fray as well and start making claims, as we've had, we've seen in the last, in a much earlier period when Kasatu was more cohesive, was able to play this role. But I think there's a huge gap uh, for us as South Africans, along with our colleagues and uh, compatriots from other countries, you know, to form coalitions to reclaim the city and to say, this is what we want. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Um, I don't see any questions, any comments. So Prof, can you please stop sharing your presentation? Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much.
Thank you. With further ado, we're going to go further into the program. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Caroline van der Berg, who is a senior lecturer at the Department of Information Systems at the University of the Western Cape. Welcome, Dr. van der Berg, and you may continue your presentation. Good afternoon, colleagues. Let me just share and get going. I'm going to stop my video. So um, I'm going to just share with you some work that uh, we've been doing in the last two years. Um, and the focus of this project is on smart and um, sustainable smart cities. So it's the SDG 11. Um, and then looking at digital social social innovation. Um, within this. I'm, I just need to acknowledge I'm doing this work with a colleague of mine, Dr. Fester from the Department of Urban Planning at CPUT. So just a little bit of background, what prompted this, this study. Um, we were deliberating and, and, and talking a lot. We were doing other work together and then looking at the, the cross function between our different um, areas. So, so uh, Belinda is an urban planner and I'm in information systems. And, and we started looking at, at ways of working together and working together with our students. And within the constructs of these uh, pressing urban environmental challenges, urban problems, and then also um, on the other hand, the complexities that we are facing in higher education and really looking at education for the future or a call for education for sustainable development. And this prompted a, an interdisciplinary project um, between us where we started getting um, my students in information systems, the postgraduate, the honors students, and the urban planning students doing the advanced diploma in urban planning together to work um, on projects within communities um, to identify really the systemic inter interrelated or wicked problems within communities, and then coming up with uh, some some ideas or digital social innovation ideas um, or technology that can address this. So the focus areas for us is really the importance of local lived knowledge and the community voice. So a, a very much emphasizing people knowing what their problems are within their own communities, um, and also solutions for their problems um, and not really coming in with a, the with a premise of saying we are going to fix your problems without really understanding these local lived ideas and really embedded knowledge in, in the communities. And then from that, also looking at, at how do we localize and operationalize the, the high level SDGs. Now, I'd said our focus is on, on SDG 11, which is uh, sustainable smart cities and communities. But as you know, these, these SDGs are really very interrelated. Um, we, whilst working with this, we are really, uh, other SDGs are also coming in, um, in terms of the problems that we are, that we are addressing or, and the, the areas that we are looking at. And then from this to say, how do we now co-create? So there's a very big emphasis on co-creation, on looking at ways to work together to develop sustainably smart digital social innovations. And it's really a way, I think uh, what was quite interesting when we started doing this to, to this experiment almost to get the students together to work together um, within these interdisciplinary spaces, um, it's, it's quite a complex place to be because our students are used to um, their area, their, their, their um, uh, subjects, but this whole cross-fertilization of disciplinary and practical knowledge, 
are really a way to address these complex interconnected challenges. Um, and we have really, actually the students I think found it uh, really complex in the beginning and, and so did we, but it's, it's a way for us to, to really work together and to really uncover these deeper lying areas. So, so the concepts that we, that we use to frame the project and um, these are, are really kind of underpinning um, more higher ideas that we use is, is, is firstly, we work with, with society, the, the idea of society 5.0. Um, and society 5.0 is really an extension of this industry 4.0 or the so-called fourth industrial revolution that was more pre that is more focused on industry organization society 5.0 is really a way where we bring in it's it's very human centered it's looking at how do we fuse the digital and the physical to cre really create smart societies. Um, so it's a high level concept, but it's really something that, that, that we use to underpin um, the philosophical work that we're doing. And then also, obviously, the smart and sustainable. Um, so what does that mean? The importance, as I stated, of, of the local, the local lived knowledge. And then within this, how do we then identify digital social innovations to talk to this and then the higher higher level SDGs. Um, so these are really our the high level concepts. And then the project has been, as I said, running for the last two years. But what has happened is we the idea was right, here we go, we're going to start working in the communities and identify certain communities to work in with our students and then COVID struck. So we couldn't really go into the communities. It was, we had a lot of problems with that. So, so what we then, and as you know, you kind of change and pivot and, and apply new ideas. So the students were then um, working as they are the representatives of their communities. They understand their communities. So they are the local lived voice. Um, so we, we then started working within the students' communities and the groups identifying a certain community and then exploring problems within that community and then starting to, to um, roll out the projects. And I'll share with you some, some examples um, after this. So, so the project is really, we are starting out um, now. Finally, we, we managed to... To, to secure some funding for the project. So we, we now working um, with, with, the, with the city of Cape Town. So, so we have a, a Czech and city of Cape Town funding and that's really gonna help going forward. So, so we now have um, partnering with, with the city of Cape Town, um, areas in the infrastructure information system and tech, as well as the environmental strategy implementation um, unit and then also within focusing on Danoon. So Potsdam Danoon is, is, is really going to be going forward our, our focus area. Um, as I said in the past, we, we worked across communities in Cape Town, um, the students' communities, but it, we felt just from, from working um, in this space for the last two years that it's, it's really necessary to start focusing on, on, specific, on a specific area and then also to start to focus on um, rolling out um, the project further because we, we, we at this stage just really working on prototypes. So, so our area that, that our research that we use is, is um, community-based participatory action research. Um, and we've started now working um, in the noon kind of initial meetings with, with, with community representatives just to kind of really set the project off uh, with our, from January or February next year when our next intake of students come. And then, um, so I'm not, there's a lot of information. So really just more in terms of, of, of uh, what we've done and the way we work and then re how are we going to, to move this forward? Um, 
So the projects are using um, the principles of design thinking. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that, but the way, the, the, the way we applied is we're using the, the Stanford School of Design. So looking at the five phases um, in terms of identifying problems and then really coming to um, a solution or a prototype. Um, what, what is interesting, what we found is, is, is with the urban planning, um, with, within urban planning, a lot of time is spent on understanding problems, these endemic problems within um, the environment, and then really spending a lot of time within that, but, but and the students not really seeing, okay, so what, what are things that we can do? And what I find with with um, with my with the information system students is they're great at at coming up with 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 like technology ways of doing, um, but often there's there's not enough a, a deep understanding in terms of what the problems really are, and there's no point in developing technology if it doesn't really address the user's problems or it's or it's designed for the user. So, so putting these groups together work really well because the students are really now kind of spending time in this empathized phase where they get a deeper understanding in terms of what the problems are. Now, these are these different problems that this, that, that, that they're working with. Um, they're working with things such as urban flooding, um, food insecurity, um, river contamination, illegal dumping, waste management, lack of environmental education, for example, and a, and a host of other areas also came about as a result of COVID. So, so these are areas the students then identify a certain problem that is very prevalent in their communities, and then we start this process of, of design thinking. Um, you can just see some of the examples here. They need to create persona. So, that, so who's the user? Who's the person with the problem? What is this problem? Getting a really deep level of understanding. And they create uh, digital stories about these problems. So a real story about the, the people in this area, how, do, how, the, how these things are affecting them. And then coming up with with ideas from the community so how do we deal with this how do what do we do what are things that we can potentially unpack with this and then they go and they um start let me just go back um in terms of the, the then they start getting up coming up with a whole lot of different ideas um, and it's really the ideation phase is the most exciting because you come up with as many ideas as you can it's a process of kind of funneling these ideas using something called a decision matrix. And then we decide, right, these are the ideas that we are going to prototype, that we are go going to build a solution for. Um, and usually we encourage uh, the teams to come up with about four prototypes, um, and which are then tested within, within their user groups and then kind of finalizing it in terms of two two prototypes that are really something that can be developed further. So what they do is they, they create um, um, applications. So we first just say very much it's uh, what, what is it going to look like? What is it going to do? How will the users interact with it? How will it solve the problem? So they come up with ideas. Um, they present this to one another, and then they present it to, to the users. And then from that, it gets refined um, in terms of potential applications that, 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 that can address these problems. Now, there are, there are a number of different ones that we've had um, in the last two years that's, that's really addressing these different issues, um, talking to a lot of it, what was interesting that in 2021, a lot of what we found was um, related around waste. Um, it's just at the onset of COVID. Um, in the last year, they, they, there was more of a focus in terms of flooding, um, river contamination, 
Um, so it, it kind of shifts and, and it's really the, 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 the problem areas come from the students themselves as re representatives of their communities. Dr. Fanabella, um, you yes. have one minute left, please. Thank you. I'm nearly done. So, so these are, are just kind of the, the different prototypes that they do coming up with. Um, this was more in terms of financial education, which was something that became really prevalent in the, in the communities uh, during COVID. And um, just in conclusion, the way forward for us is um, now starting with our, with our partnership with, with the city of Cape Town and, and then in focusing on Danoon, and then really being able to develop the prototypes further. We're sitting with these wonderful ideas, these wonderful prototypes. So it's really a way of saying, right, now we can start building this and, and, and really start implementing it and see how it works in the community. Um, and then really this shift from an, in, from an interdisciplinary to a more transdisciplinary approach, really working in partnership with a whole lot of different community groups. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Van der Berg, for your very, very valuable presentation. I do not see any questions. Is there any questions, any comments? Maybe just a question from my side. I'm not so familiar with the digital systems because I'm so old school. But I, I hear certain words, um, food security, food waste, issues that I, for instance, in my field are familiar with. And I also see the um, inter, uh, interlinked approach or, or interdisciplinary approach. My question is, um, I just want to ask, what do you plan to do with the information that you will obviously accumulate from the community? How will it fit into the various programs that is already existing within the university or within different disciplines? Because I think the work that is being done through the program can be used in other programs within the university that is already established or is already in existence. Thanks, Elaine. Yes, um, uh, that is really where we want to go. And this is a kind of, as I said, this, this kind of focus towards a more tr a transdisciplinary, you know, working towards seeing how this is interlinked in other areas. This far, we, we've, we've published more in terms of what we have learned in the process on the more towards the teaching and learning aspects of it. And now it's going to start opening up a lot more in terms of findings, um, working with the communities. And I think this is going to be where I'm going to have to start reaching out to, to colleagues in other areas. Yeah. Um, also, um, my colleague that I'm working with um, in urban planning, um, from that side, seeing what kind of research we are gathering. Um, obviously, my area and what, what I find interesting would be more on the on the technology, the, 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 the tech side of things, and how do we yeah. how do we use technology for good and how do we build and, and learnings and findings from that. But I think there's there's potential. I mean, we we're really excited about um, we started it as an experiment and it's kind of morphed into something a lot bigger and, and it's it's kind of gaining more and more momentum. So so I think it's definitely something that I would like to participate yeah. with other pot, other yeah. colleagues as well. Yes, I think what you are actually presenting is so valuable for this week because we are sitting with information within the city and oh, not in the city, within the university. We just need to reach out to each other and we will get whatever we are looking for. We don't need to work in silos. We have to interlink. We have to work with each other. Thank you so much. Dr. Thank Pantera. you. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Okay, thank you. Um, colleagues, with, uh, we will move to our next presenter, which is Dr. Dube and Professor Ansihano. Dr. Dube is a postdoctoral fellow in political studies department at the University of the Western Cape. And Professor Fihano Asihano is an associate professor in the Department of Political Studies, also at the University of the Western Cape. 
I'm giving over to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aileen. I don't know if you can see my screen. I've not managed to. Thank you, Dr. Aileen. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, Dr. Eileen, if you could confirm if you can hear me clearly. My yes, I can hear you and I can see you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Meli, as um, uh, uh, Dr. Eileen has introduced me. Uh, I'll be presenting our paper, the paper that I'm working with, uh, Professor Ashiano. Um, so the presentation, our, our paper is titled uh, The Illusions of CBS Sanitation Solution lessons from PFT provision in Kailicha, Cape Town. I see that there are two abbreviations there, CBS and PFT. CBS is container-based sanitation, and PFT wow. means port portable flush toilets, which is our case study in this paper. So um, I'm going to structure the presentation in, in four parts. There will be the background uh, and problem, then the theoretical framework and methods, findings and discussion, and then the conclusion. Professor Anciano will come in uh, during discussion or maybe to fill in uh, if I leave any gaps and if there's still time. So without much ado, let me start by talking to the global overview of uh, sanitation. So um, safely managed sanitation is a fundamental human right, uh, which is central to human dignity. As um, uh, according, that's according to the UN, and also uh, some of you would know that uh, SGD uh, 6.2 also speaks to sanitation and the need for um, ending open defecation and ensuring that everyone uses safely managed sanitation. Um, but at the moment, um, there are billions of people in the world that do not have sanitation, particularly 2.2 billion uh, urban residents or 29% of the global population do not have safely managed sanitation as of 2019. Uh, and over 60% of those are in the sub-Saharan Africa and they're in poor, they reside in poor um, informal settlements where they do not have um, sanitation. Um, they are off-grid residents, basically. They are not uh, connected to the sorts of things of cities. And in South Africa, more than 7 million citizens live in informal settlements and they do not have running water and sanitation, electricity. Uh, earlier on, I think someone mentioned Former settlements, particularly Cape Town, also um, the previous speaker spoke slightly to issues of waste, but this is particularly about sanitation. Uh, so it's about toilets, basically. So in that in that context that I've just uh, sort of that picture that I've just painted of billions of people without sanitation, there have been ongoing attempts to find solutions. Um, and CBS, container-based sanitation, is framed as one of the ideal solutions for areas that do not have, uh, that have, that do not have sewers uh, and have, um, you know, they're off-grid. So, um, but let me define what CBS is. So this is the non-sewer sanitation solution where excreta or human waste is captured in sealable containers and then they're trans transport, transported and then emptied. Uh, at certain points. So they require limited infrastructure. And use um, so they are being piloted, these uh, CBS technologies are being piloted by states and non-state actors. Uh, so state actors would be an example of uh, a city like Cape Town. Um, so they are serious major proponents of this um, ideal uh, of using CBS to, you know, to cater for those that are not on the on the on the grids of cities. So they see CBS as, as a low cost option, which reduces water demand and potentially reducing carbon emissions as well. It is also seen as a rapid answer, rapid answer to open defecation uh, and exposure to of vulnerable people to, you know, the risks that are associated with shared uh, sanitation. Let me just show you an example of one of the container-based sanitations, which is um, coincidentally, it's also our, um, our, our case study. 
uh, it's, it's known as a portable flush toilet. Um, and as you can see here in my presentation, um, it has got, um, it comes in two components. There's an upper tank and a lower tank. An upper tank also has a toilet seat and uh, somewhere to flush there. But you do not flush onto the sewer system. You only flush into the lower tank, which holds the waste until it's, um, it's detached and then taken for, for cleaning. And then uh, it, it's brought back to the user. So um, the advocates for, for CBS, you know, some of them as powerful as your Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Bank, are attracted by that green market-based narrative, which I, I alluded to when I was talking about, you know, the potential for reducing uh, carbon emissions. Uh, however, despite funding and this massive advocacy at the global level, there has not been rapid scaling up of this um, uh, CBS technology in the last decade. Uh, so the proponents have uh, cited you no know, lack of investors and regulatory support. So about this issue of investors, one of the beliefs is that um, uh, it can be funded, CBS container-based sanitation can be funded through something called circular economy. That is turning human waste into products that can be sold and then money goes back into funding you know the scaling up of that uh, of that system, but that that has not been happening in the last ten years. And I mentioned that uh, it is implemented. At, you know, it's being piloted by cities and some uh, non-state actors. Um, and then, so recent research shows that you know the claims of uh, this market sustainability of fecal waste processing are overstated, and they often lack contextual understanding of political economy. So um, the city of Cape Town is one of the cities that provides CBS, as I mentioned, and it provides tens of thousands of CBS units in informal settlements, uh, yet res residents uh, of those informal settlements are notoriously unhappy with this form of sanitation. Uh, so we ask the question, does CBS offer a solution to the sanitation challenge in Cape Town? We're using Cape Town, and particularly BM section, as a case study of trying to, 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 to answer this question. And then we draw on the concept of infrastructural citizenship developed by uh, Charlotte Demans to analyze the flush toilets, which I mentioned earlier on that they are our case case study. And the area that we're studying is BM section, uh, which is a part of, um, which is a pocket of informal settlement in Kailicha and Cape Town. So the concept of informal inf infrastructural citizenship analyzes how citizens of the state mediate their relationship in terms of expectations, perceptions, and actions through public infrastructure. And the public infrastructure in this case would be your uh, portable flush toilets. Uh, and citizenship uh, is embodied in infrastructure for both citizens and the state. The state is materially and visibly represented through everyday access and inaccess to public infrastructure. So the, the city and citizens in, interact via public infrastructure. So citizenship is about the everyday activities and encounters between the state and society. And uh, the state and society demonstrate their rights and responsibilities you know, over this infrastructure. So this is the framework that uh, we use to then try and analyze what exactly is happening. <clears throat> I must have uh, um, omitted this, but um, I got it here. So this paper is part of a global four country study comparing Lima in Peru, Cape Asian in Haiti, Nairobi in Kenya, and Cape Town. So, and it also is a part of um, the uh, a new research group called uh, Urban Governance and Politics within the EMS. Um, so we collected data for two years now uh, through interviews. Uh, we've interviewed over 30 people. Some of them are users, some of them are non-users in PM section. <clears throat> Officials from the city of Cape Town, uh, this unit called the Informal Settlement Basic Services Unit. Private companies that service PFTs, civil society organizations that are involved. And we're also collecting data through uh, smartphones, through um, an app called Open Data Kit. Uh, and we have about 100 participants, 50 users, and 59 users, PFTs in, in BM section. 
So uh, that's massive primary data that we've been collecting and continue to collect. So um, from that data, some of the, the results that we found, obviously uh, we're also drawing from uh, secondary sources. There's been a lot of writing about um, sanitation in Cape Town and specifically and also urban. So um, sanitation is a right for all citizens in South Africa. Um, and this is based on this kind of legislation from the constitution itself, which implies this, and also specific policies. Uh, they draw from the post-apartheid vision for uh, catering previously deprived populations. Um, and the provision of houses and adequate sanitation failed. The, the initial policy was to say, let's provide houses through your RTP and stuff. And when it failed, or once it failed, the state then moved to say, okay, let's subsidize fully water and sanitation for, for all people, including those in the common settlement. And municipalities in South Africa are obliged to provide basic services, including water and sanitation, and not only to people in formal areas, but also those in informal areas. The city of Cape Town provides uh, those services to about 200 informal settlements. Um, so they claim this is the city itself claiming that. And ideally, um, this provision is uh, at a ratio of one toilet to five households, and it is supposed that Lee was supposed to be within 200 meters uh, of walking distance. So, um, um, but ideally the city of Cape Town would um, want to install full flush toilets, but where there are disputes in land ownership uh, and other constraints such as topographical and financial, the city then installs uh, container-based toilets. So um, in BM section, the city provides about four types of toilets. Um, they are shared full flush toilets. Um, some of them are in, in singular um, structures, just stand alone. Some of them are blocks, are clusters of toilets and spaces for people to wash and, and, and bath. Then they are shared chemical toilets. Uh, what they, what's known as chemical toilets. These are uh, these three, the last three are CBS types, which are container based toilets. So, chemical toilets, container toilets, and the portable flush toilet that I spoke about. Uh, so, the city provides about 22,000 uh, portable flush toilets, and 930 of those are in BM section. So, uh, and BM section is our case study, and the, the PFTs are what we are focusing. So, uh, they are issued to each household. There are waste containment cartridges um, taken to the nearest uh, road. There is one major road there. Then they are emptied three times a week. They are um, emptied at uh, Water's Quarry Water Treatment Works, works uh, of Cape Town. And then uh, CBS toilets are serviced by private companies. All the CBS, all the container-based toilets are serviced by um, uh, private companies that are hired by the city. Um, so, one thing that we found is that there's a high demand for portable flush toilets. Um, as I mentioned, there are different types of uh, container-based toilets, but uh, there's a high demand for this particular one, the portable flush toilet. Um, um, so, we asked ourselves, why do informal settlement residents prefer this, this type of container-based toilet? We found three reasons. Uh, one, it's more convenient. People can have it within their household or just close by to the to their shack, and then it also then prevents, you know, them from being harmed, uh, especially at night. Um, you know, there is lots of crime that people experience uh, in the shared facilities, and then there is also improved dignity and privacy. They can use the toilet on their own and in their private space. But do these positives make it a solution? To the sanitation challenge in, in Cape Town. So we keep asking, uh, uh, so what does it mean? Um, not quite, because there is poor cleaning and handling. Uh, where we see, we saw that some of the cartridges get stolen and uh, destroyed and sold as a scrap uh, plastic to recycling companies. There's no um, Sorry, security. Dr. Jobe, you yes. have about two minutes left. Two minutes left. 
Okay, so these are some of the problems that uh, some cartridges are not properly cleaned. And then uh, there's also poor maintenance by the city um, of those um, toilets. Some of the, the, the users, for instance, one of them was saying that, uh, you know, they're not in a good condition, but were forced to use them. Space is also a problem. Few users keep uh, these portable flush toilets inside their shacks, but the assumption by the city was that everyone will keep them inside. That's not the case. Uh, and then there's also contestations, um, you know, which we call contested political economy of uh, container-based uh, toilets. The city doesn't have enough budget for servicing effectively and efficiently, and then also uh, scaling it up. And then um, sewer toilets um, are, the mo are more cost-effective than container-based toilets. That's what the city tells us. So it would rather provide uh, um, sewer toilets rather than um, container-based toilets. And then the users themselves, they see container-based toilets as you know, a remnant of the bucket system of the apartheid uh, era. Um, they just use them because they have no alternative. Some of you, I think, can see what's written on the placards. This is from back in 2013, where people were protesting this, this type of toilet. So basically, we ask ourselves, are these toilets for the poor? Um, is it a solution or is it just, uh, you know, just enough for the poor? Um, so what are we saying about all this? At face value, container-based toilets is acceptable. However, it is an illusion. Um, it's, it's not a solution, but an illusion. So um, PFTs that we're looking at, they are neither a dignified or sustainable sanitation solution. Um, they are not aligned, the provision of container-based sanitation is not aligned with post apartheid promises um, of infrastructure citizenship. At best, it is a temporary uh, option that supplements others. And uh, um, therefore overcoming these constraints of having hundreds of thousands or even millions of citizens without sanitation in a city like Cape Town um, would take a focus on providing uh, sewer uh, uh, sanitation, which is what the city says is sustainable and also which is what uh, residents prefer. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dube. Uh, will your colleague, Professor Ansihano, present? Is there any comments? Can you please remove your presentation? Professor Ansihano, is there anything that you would like to add to the presentation before we take any comments, any questions? Hi, I think just to, to kind of reinforce the fact that on the surface it really can seem like there is a sustainable long-term solution by having a product to show it. And we thought that that might be the case. And I think we've also thought that the Lotia initially was going to run sort. The city of Cape Town provides, to our knowledge, the largest number of free portable flush toilets in the world. And this is what's out of our I think it's had lots of we've been working with a global team of researchers. And so it's all of places. Professor, I know we can't hear you. I'm not sure if the other thing is can get. Oh yeah. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes, I can. Oh my gosh, I'm on it. Um, we can't hear you. No, we can't. No, we can't. Melody, is there anything that you can do from your side? Um, Professor, maybe if you try switching off your camera, it could possibly be your bandwidth. And just check your audio um, if you're using a, a headset. No, Prof, unfortunately, it's really bad. Perhaps Perhaps you want to put your, your comment in the Q&A 
and um, Dr. Dubey or Dr. Sinek can maybe read it out for you. Dr. Sinden, while well, um, Professor, Associate Professor Anciano is um, putting a reply in the Q&A box, you may want to go to the next question. Uh, I see the question is off here, Melody. I don't see the question. It has been dismissed, my son. May I read it for you? Yes, please. Um, from, an, from Anonymous, it says, so interesting. How has it been gathering data via the app? What have been the pros or cons? Okay, um, thank you. Should I go ahead? You may, Mr. Doctor, yes. Yes, so... Um, that's, uh, there's, a, there's a long answer to that, but the, the shorter answer is that uh, it's been quite a struggle, particularly because um, I think um, one of our assumptions was that uh, the ownership of, um, of smartphones is high in South Africa, but we found out that most people that had smartphones, uh, they had smartphones that were not compatible with the, the app called uh, ODK, which is the one that we use to, to collect data. So um, through the survey that we're running. Um, um, I, I should say also that, uh, you know, we still have preliminary results uh, that were analyzed from that. There hasn't been a comprehensive analysis of what data we got. Um, they skept were skeptical that obviously, are we going to get um, uh, the data that, that we really will really be useful, but we have lots of um, uh, ways of ensuring that our data remains um, valuable, valid, and also uh, because we're, we're, we know that some people just take maybe five minutes to just answer, take out the phone, answer yes, no, yes, no, and then put the phone away. Um, and then those are some of the things that we're realizing. But um, we were also, we also distributed phones to people and there's weekly technical support for those participants, the 100 participants that are in the M section for them to answer. And then we also support them with data. So it's quite a, an elaborate process, but that's difficult, that's pioneering, and we look forward to also sharing our, our results maybe in future papers as well. Uh, method, method, methodological, that is. No, we can't hear you properly. I'm so sorry, I give up. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Anciano and Dr. Dobe for your presentations. We will move on to the next presenter, which is uh, Mr. Grant Hearn. Oh, you can, yes, sorry about that. Uh, Mr. Grant Hearn joined UWC in 19, 1997 from industry and has remained in the information system department since then. Pro, uh, Mr. Hearn, you may go ahead, please and start your presentation, thank you. Thank you, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, I'm just sharing my screen. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm just going to jump straight in to speaking about an initial clean slate approach to developing a model for sustainable ICT for D project dependencies. And let's just uh, have a little background. Uh, ICT for D is just an acronym for information and communication technologies for development. And it's a collective term that's used to describe development projects that are aimed at bridging the digital divide. And the quick definition of the digital divide is an uneven distribution in access to use of or impact of information and communication technologies between any number of distinct groups. And these groups are defined based on various criteria, social, geographical, geopolitical, and in Africa, quite importantly, gender. In Africa, 
the digital divide is globally the widest in terms of quite a number of, faction, uh, of factors. Um, internet user penetration and percentage of households with internet access and online learners um, are quite important. I just want to show you some graphics quickly. So for example, here we can see that Africa is, has less than half of the internet user penetration that the next nearest uh, region has, which is the Arab states, and only about a quarter of that of Europe. So we are in a bad position as far as that is concerned. And then households with internet access is also very low. And although these figures are a few years old, uh, I, I don't believe there has been a great uh, change uh, in the situation, although a small um, improvement may have been made because of the COVID situation. But nonetheless, we can clearly see that Africa uh, is uh, in a parlous state as far as the digital divide is concerned. Now, there's a very large body of literature that covers ICT4D globally, and in particular in developing countries. But interestingly, there's a great deal of digital divide, even in developed countries. Um, most of this literature reports very limited benefits realization and sustainability from these uh, ICT4D projects. The problems are that achieving proper delivery of benefits from these projects is in aggregate a very complex space and it suffers from problems of local complexities and community dynamics and even politics. So in addition, the discussion around what actually constitutes the right kind of benefits that should be delivered is still ongoing. And authors such as Mtoko and Kene and a couple of years ago found that in South Africa, although ICT should be acting as a catalyst for social change, there's very limited empirical evidence to support this in spite of a number of such projects being in place. A review of the literature has shown that worldwide, there's very little in the way of direct causal relationships between these projects and poverty alleviation. And there's also a sparsity of sound general methodologies for ICT4D implementation and specifically for benefits identification, delivery, realization, and me measurement. And frameworks for and models of ICT4D project implementations, the benefits realization and the sustainability are also incomplete. And this leads to two important points that are emergent from the literature. The first one is that the research has been hampered by the lack of a sound contiguous theoretical basis. And secondly, Research into a generally applicable methodology for dealing with local complexities uh, in implementation of projects is sparse. The nature and the complexity of the local divide has not been adequately considered. So now considering these problems, uh, it seems to suggest that ICT4D might benefit from a new or a different approach to benefits realization, and in particular one that is based on sound theoretical principles that are already there and firmly established. So if you're taking a tabula rasa approach, the problem becomes, well, where to begin really? Um, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, Russell and Whitehead produced an extraordinary three volume dissertation on called Principia Mathematica, in which they tried to derive all of set theory and three parts of number theory from nothing using just logic. And after 360 pages, they produced a proposition that explained that one plus one was equal to two and went on to say, this proposition is occasionally useful. So clearly, you know, clean slate approaches have their downside. And I didn't want to end up with uh, Russell and Whitehead, uh, Whitehead ended up, but then in the same breath, Whitehead also said that all sciences, as they strive for perfection, become mathematical in their approach. So I thought, well, okay, perhaps I should try to get the jump on perfection and try a mathematical approach to the ICT4D space. So the complexity of the local digital divide being a major identified factor in these problems, it seemed like it might be a good place to begin. Uh, 
And the complexity actually represents a web of interconnected discrete factors from which the difficulty and benefits realization tends to arise. And the fact that there are all of these interconnected and discrete factors suggested that discrete mathematics might actually be the good vehicle for some analysis because it has a 300 year long established foundation and techniques. And if we could successfully apply it to ict for d it might help to provide some of the needed sound and contiguous theoretical basis. Uh, just by way of quick explanation, discrete math studies mathematical structures that are discrete as opposed to continuous. So essentially what we have here is a continuous function and this is a discrete function. It produces single values that are separate from one another, like for example, the integers. Graph theory is an important part of discrete mathematics and it's used to model the relationships between objects of any kind and only the relationships the connections are important the spatial positioning of things it is completely irrelevant so if we look at these 11 points or nodes as they are called or vertices this might represent something like a group of 12 people and we are illustrating which of them know each other and obviously this outlier at bottom left is a person that is a stranger to everybody else in the group. So there is no connection between this person and the rest of the group. Uh, graph theory is also very useful for complex uh, relationships like networks and, and the internet, even describing the internet done with things like graph theory. The local digital divide includes this complex web of interconnected factors. So could we use graph theory as a means to formally, formally establish, represent, and analyze the connectedness. And would it then be a good tool for analyzing uh, the ICT4D project benefits delivery space? By taking this clean slate approach, I could assume very little. So I decided that I should just begin by simply asking uh, questions about the space. Eventually, there were 50 of these questions. And here's an example of some of them. I ask things like, is the mere presence of access to ICT enough to convince people to make use of them? How and why are these projects funded? What are the factors that make ICT access sustainable and successful? Where do we need to focus to ensure benefits on the individual, on the community, or both? What are the most common reasons for ict for d project failure? And do we actually know what they are? And so on. So this is a small uh, uh, sample of those questions. And once I had all of the questions that came up, I analyzed them for common terms and concepts. And in this case, a common term or concept was one which appeared at least twice. And 33 of them were identified in these questions. And here they are. It's, this is just an unordered list. There is no um, hierarchy here one does not come before the other and one is not more important uh, than the other. Uh, on the basis of these, I tried to see how they were connected to one another. And I produced this graph, which uh, the, the labels are not particularly important here. Uh, what I meant now by related to each, each other is if we say, for example, look at community benefits, we will see that attached to that is intangible benefits or tangible benefits and also individual benefits are related to community benefits and community behavior will also be related to community benefits so you can see connections between all of these 33 uh, concepts were uh, established once that had been done then i made an attempt to find communities of nodes. In other words, nodes in the graph that were related more to each other than to the other nodes to see what might emerge. And this is what emerged. Now, uh, these communities here, I labeled with arbitrarily, we you know, arbitrary terms that just came out of essentially what concepts were involved in there. So I called it the access arena, the operational arena, the sustainable arena, 
and the benefits arena, but these could have had other names like the project arena or something like that. They're just arbitrary names. What could be learned from this analysis is that the emergent arenas do not form a linear or a circular relationship, but they made a complex four-dimensional web, which is a feature that is not really obvious from this original graph. So that was quite interesting. Then it was instructional that a set of arbitrary and ad hoc unanswered questions about the ICT for D space had enough information in them to actually produce these four arenas. And the result indicates that graph theory may well be applicable to the relationships and factors that are included in the ICD, ICT for D space. And we see this in the fact that the arenas that emerged actually conform to those that are identified in empirical studies of ICT for D projects in Africa. So, for example, uh, Mamba and Isiberia came up uh, with this um, model. And you see that there is a, a, a large overlap here. There is an overlap with my sustainability arena. The implementation arena is essentially also the, the project arena. Goal determination overlaps with the benefits arena and so on. And in an earlier study, Smith uh, identified three crucial factors and four key components of these kind of projects. And the crucial factors were value, sustainability, and scalability. And these in a way overlap, well, sustainability is an arena for that. Scalability becomes the, the project arena and value um, also is, is part of the access arena. These components down here can be conflated essentially into the benefits arena. So we're getting a, a very interesting correlation from starting from absolutely nothing and just asking some questions with models that have come out of uh, empirical work. Even this um, model by Mtoko and Kene from a couple of years ago, which only looked at the outcomes and impacts, so really the benefits arena more than anything else, still nonetheless, um, the sustainability arena is there as well as, as the, the benefits arena. So uh, there is a general and interesting correlation here. Um, in conclusion then, SDGs one and nine speak amongst others to the eradication of poverty, uh, to equitable access to resources and technology and the building of resilient infrastructure and universal and affordable access to ICT and the digital economy. ICD for D, ICT for D projects have been, and they'll probably continue to be a major vehicle for addressing these goals, but they're laboring under the difficulties of local complexities. So there's a need to improve the benefits realization in such projects. Graph theory has been useful in an overhead examination of the space, but this is just a stepping stone. What needs to follow is an examination of both planned and already implemented projects using graph theory in order to determine whether it can usefully identify things like critical paths and identify which factors, if are not present or sufficiently considered, might most likely lead to a failure of the project to deliver the right benefits. Graph theory has all kinds of techniques for uh, establishing these kind of critical pathways and also for showing which nodes in the network are vitally necessary uh, for it to function. So if we can succeed in this, it would be of great value to the realization of SDGs one and nine and parts of some others. And it would also really be a boon to ICT for D projects. But as I say, uh, this work is really just the first step and it needs to be expanded into uh, a more empirical approach. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Anne. Can you stop sharing, please? Uh, I just need the need to pop up. And I can't seem to find the Zoom now. Here it is. Colleagues, I seem to have lost the Zoom presentation. Hang on. Let me just close everything else. No. Oh.
Melody can have the it. presentation from her side. There we go. There we go. Thank you once again, Mr. Hearn, for a very, very insightful presentation. As previously mentioned, I'm very, I'm technically confused. So <laughs> that was very, very insightful. I don't see any questions or any comments from our attendees. Is there any questions, any comments from anybody? before we move to our last and final presentation of the day? Nothing. Thank you so much, Mr. Hearn. Thank you for your time. Our next presenter for the day is, or the last one for the day, is Professor Sean Pather, who is a Professor and Chair of the Department of Information Systems and Deputy Dean for Research in the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences at UWC. A very welcome to you, Professor Painter, and I'm giving over to you to continue with your presentation. Okay, are we there? Thank you, Chair, and a very good uh, afternoon to your colleagues. I know I'm standing between you and the closing of, here, of the UWC Research Week. It's my absolute pleasure to um, present to you this afternoon. I think following on Grant, this is a, uh, an apt presentation to make uh, because in this presentation, I aim to produce or, or demonstrate benefits from an ICT for development intervention. This is not a project, this is a real life uh, intervention. It's a spin-off from the University of the Western Cape. It's a registered company, it's, it works, it has people, etc. Uh, what I'd like to do this afternoon then is to demonstrate how a community network model can, uh, so let me get a pointer here, become a sustainable solution towards the rural broadband conundrum, as you've just heard from Grant on the difficulties of showing benefits and sustainability. <clears throat> and over a period of five years, uh, it, I can attest that it is indeed a difficult matter. To provide evidence from this uh, intervention of Zenzeleni as a case of the benefits of rural communities and to provide a broad framework for the sustainable business model. Now, in broad terms, what is the problem? Well, there's, there's no argument about this because this is the informal source, but there's a lot of formal source that argue about, about the role of the internet or access to the internet in terms of achieving sustainable development goals. You've just seen some data in the last presentation in terms of the disparity across, across the world in terms of access to the internet. Sustainable um, development goal nine in particular uh, argues under 9C that one of the objectives is to significantly increase access to ICT and strive to provide universal and affordable access to the internet. However, <clears throat> despite well-founded policies, and we have many of them around the world, South Africa included, rural people are very neglected and they remain outside this information society. There's no dispute, I think, uh, at government level and even at the level of the UN in terms of the rights of all people uh, to have unfettered access to the internet. Uh, the problem is, and uh, initially for me and in the rest of Africa, the rural poor in particular are the least connected and they, are, they remain very squarely outside of the digital divide. Um, Grant shared some for us, but just very quickly, the World Summit on Information Society was convened first in 2003, and 17 years later, as you've seen now, uh, from Grant just now, but in the least development countries, we have this problem of 27%. In South Africa, by the way, at a household level, the most recent community survey indicates about a 12% household penetration. This slide is simply, there's a, lot, there's a lot of figures here, I don't want to confuse you, but just to show you the divide between the rural and urban, uh, 12 versus 18, et cetera. So there's a stark divide just to underscore that. However, <clears throat> the problem is it's a matter that's just, that's beyond access. It's beyond access. How we facilitate social and economic development through sustained use is what's needed. And we cannot automatically make 
the assumption that um, access equals benefit. So in the model, which I use called the community informatics framework, there are different layers that are integrated, the access, the adoption, and the social, social appropriation, effective use layers, all of which are integrated and needs a holistic, a holistic look at. Um, so, so the issue is that an individual must be able to harness agency to make choice. And I draw this on the Kleiner's choice framework. So what are community networks, which is what, what, what this is about? Um, Zenzeleni Networks, which means do it yourself. Uh, it's a not-for-profit company. It's a spin-off from the UWC. It was registered in 2017 by UWC, together with other founding partner organizations. Its roots lie in the PhD work and postdoc work led by Dr. Carlos Ray Moreno um, in the Department of Computer Science <clears throat> um, uh, under Prof. Bill Tucker. The, this is the Zenzeleni has got a lot of attention. It's, it's been uh, receiving a lot of awards and the like. And this is just some example of the awards that we've received um, over a period of time. So, what are community networks? Uh, there are a number of definitions, but broadly speaking, um, I would just refer to the third bullet here about an innovative arrangement for communities to self provide. However, I, I dare say in terms of this kind of definition here, there's a lot of romanticism about the expectation of self-provision as we've learned through this project and as I will demonstrate to you just now. Just to say in keeping with my community informatics um, uh, framework that I presented earlier on, in the way we try to um, utilize, apply Zenzeleni, we try to look at all of these pillars in a kind of holistic fashion, rather than it being just an infrastructure matter, which to us it isn't. In fact, if I had time in a different presentation, the infrastructure problem is probably the easiest. So where is the deployment? It is in the Eastern Cape uh, in an area. The, this is the first of two areas. There are two areas right now we are examining footprints in a third. There's about 580 households, typical rural area. Uh, 86 kilometers from the nearest formal town, um, poor basic services, very low income, low levels of education, very typical of rural South Africa. Um, very picturesque, by the way, this is the view of the valley as you drive out from Tata and enter into the depths of the rural area. So pre-network, this is some of the data that Carlos had collected. Um, indicating that there was, at this time in 2015, an MTN signal, 86% of people were using the phone, 22% of the disposable income went into mobile phone services because this was voice at that time. And um, a small number of them bought internet bundles from MTN, but importantly, what was found is that some of them, or 15%, were sacrificing on basic food because they had given more importance to telecoms, because connection to the out, outside world was deemed an important part of livelihoods for them for different reasons. So what was the model? A local cooperative was set up um, and, and, and registered. This is the Zenzeleni cooperative. So everyone that you see here are directors of the, of the locally owned network. Uh, we applied on their behalf and they had exemption from the regulator. And this, as you can see, is the license from the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa, which you need to operate a, um, a network. As you can see here, um, you know, lots of very rich uh, data in terms of, of providing hope for the future for people through giving them access to the internet. And this is just an example from Tata David Trokosi, who's one of the cooperative members who didn't understand and as a new frontier has kind of arisen in front of them. Technically, what this is, um, it's very simply, this is the network, it's wireless, we use, it's, it's, it's constructed over a uh, unlicensed spectrum uh, uh, band, and uh, what it consists of right now is about is 74 hotspots, there's 18 wireless clients across the network, and 205 different pieces of network devices, all of this making up the network. 
which basically connects to a point of presence in Tata and is a wireless connection then between all these nodes that you see here. Um, I, I'm going to just skip through the slide, the, some of these um, because it's not my intention, but other than to say that the technical feasibility of developing a network like this is probably one of the easiest ways. And this is a low cost network. Um, and here's some pictures of, of training the local community of the local community in action, setting, getting trained to set up the network and uh, install the network. Um, no gender dis disparities, everybody coming on board, learning how to do things. There's a kid sitting in the fields trying to connect to a network point. So very interesting. Uh, more recently, one of the achievements has been the launch, which is just a month ago, the a solar lab in partnership with Dell Foundation, um, where an entire two containers were roped in, the local community helped, and a lab has been built. So this provides a kind of central hub technology hub for the community to access the network because not everybody has mobile devices in a community like this. And this is the one of the directors that's now opening the, opening the lab. Uh, this is me here with our project manager that was on site for this, uh, for this um, community ICT hub. So um, what has happened over the five years? Over the five years, what we've learned is that firstly seed funding is important. There's capacity building and support. And we call at about an 18 month startup phase and an 18 month nurturing phase. But on an ongoing basis, there has to be an ecosystem, an ongoing ecosystem. The products in the Zendeleni network comprises uncapped data vouchers and the capped services. So there are two types of services. So people are able to buy for 25 Rand, 32 days at a speed of two megabit per second on the network. And other clients who provide, uh, who, are, uh, who buy services on a contract basis, um, get charged on a speed and, um, and real news basis. But importantly, if you look here, it's 63 times cheaper than what mobile operators are charging. And there are mobile operators, MTN in particular. Now, the evidence of value, firstly, is, well, in 2019, I did a survey, a structured survey, face-to-face -face, um, interviews to a stratified sampling of households in the Mancosi village. Benefits, indications of benefits from the, from the users were on, for personal use, social, economic, and importantly, a lot of emphasis being put on them in terms of government relations, which was actually quite surprising to me, uh, given that the very low level of kind of network services being provided by government. But this is the, 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 the kind of importance attributed to that. Um, the, the terms of the tasks for which people use the internet, as you can see, a health, government communication, again, featuring very highly, economic uses, social education, entertainment, and, and, and I was surprised also by this, with family communication being among the lowest. So this was, this was in 2019. Then, because the Technology Innovation Agency funded us in the last few two years or so, we had to do an outcome evaluation. So we had an independent assessment done between April and June. And the objective was to undertake a review of the program over the past few years and to understand what needs to be done to improve long-term outputs. We had a participatory process to develop the evaluation design. This is called the theory of change model, which I just want to put up on the screen to demonstrate to you. But basically, we developed it to match. This is typically ME type methodology to, to develop, to link outputs to the short term outcomes to the medium term outcomes, because we're not yet at the stage of being able to evaluate. So, largely, this was the kind of theory of change in that we used to conduct the evaluation. There were interviews and focus groups, which yielded um, qualitative data. Um, uh, these were the interviews and two focus groups with the two cooperatives. Uh, 299 structured interviews using a sampling frame, which had the requirement of having used a voucher in the last 30 days. Um, key findings out of this independent outcome was one communities, the community has an awareness. They understand the social and economic benefit to their community and to themselves. They are in support of the network. And now you might think that, you know, but isn't this obvious? Actually, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, it is not obvious as our experience over five years. The mere provision of a, of a, of a, of a network, 
does not ensure all of these things here. Um, and uh, the recommendation out of this was that we had to do more community awareness. Uh, highly positive findings were that the vouchers that we sell that, that, that are being sold at 25 Rand are easily accessible. And what was modestly positive, which we know, is that the spread of hotspots could be increased and that the, our capacity to technically support the functioning of the network needs to be improved. Again, as you can see here, um, the typical uses are not that different from what we found in 2019. The youth are kind of the most prolific um, uh, users. And importantly to me, although they're using this for entertainment, I can say through kind of anecdotal qualitative interaction I've had in the field there, the ability to find, you know, access entertainment, access news, access sport has made a huge difference to the youth in this, in this, in this um, rural area. Um, for people, um, um, the business owners that were using the network had reported positive benefits towards their, their um, um, business use. Um, so what we can find out of this is that we have data of actual use and the benefits as a consequence. There is the data there. We can conclude that there's, if there's consistent and ongoing provision, and I must underscore affordable, 25 Rand, by the way, is not cheap for a lot of people in these areas, 25 Rand a month, right? There's potential for outcome. Um, there are uh, indications of an empirical studies, and this will soon be published, um, this data that I'm presenting, when there's sustained access to internet services. Um, so we are proving that if you can, there would be benefit if you can do that. From the operations data, which is the third element of the benefits I want to show you is that I simply want to just draw your attention here to show you from 2017 to 2020, how the number of anchor clients grew from 1,000 to 6,822. 6, and the database usage over those period from 0 0.5 terabytes per month to 19 terabytes per month. During COVID, right? The, the, the data significantly increased from three to 19 terabytes. And can you imagine a community like this being outside of the, um, of the, of the internet during a time of COVID and lockdown? The blue here represents the amount of expenditure flowing out to the operators and to, for the for-profit companies. But in this model here, everything that you see in orange is expenditure, a large amount of the expenditure being retained. So the economic model of paying for telecoms and retaining it in the community is one of the benefits of this. As you can see, an evolution of cost. This is the voucher costs versus the average cost of big operators selling vouchers coming down. There's, it comes nowhere near what they are paying for the community network cost. So in conclusion, after five years of trials, what do we do? Well, this here is a, is, a, is a map that shows income of households from high to low and geographical reach. People in rural areas are always going to be here, which means it requires ongoing support. So the Zenzeleni model is something that is required. And our main goal is how to, how to sustain it. We, we, are, we propose that a two-tier model that local ownership comprises, um, which I'll show you on the next slide, but there's a local ownership model versus a meso level, which is what is the NPC, the company that UWC spun out, a not-for-profit company to coordinate and support is needed. But the business element of this is not as simple as it seems, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm just gonna skip this slide and talk about this. The community ownership model has changed from cooperative after five years. We believe now that the way we do community ownership is that there's a Wi-Fi hotspot owner at level one. So a person can own a single hotspot or multiple hotspots, and that will be his or her micro business. As they add value added services to their business, they become a level two micro entrepreneur. And they could eventually take up an entire sub district or sub village and become a level three entrepreneur. So rather than the cooperative, we see local ownership to the micro entrepreneurs, which is what our data is take, telling us. This is the Zenzeleni not-for-profit company. This is the structure, and these are the functionality, functionalities that we are recommending. 
Right now, there is a board. UWC has three seats. I'm the chair of this board. We have a general manager based in the Eastern Cape. Um, what we know is that the model can become self-sustainable in 24 months. I must point out to you, ladies and gentlemen, there is no evidence yet of, a, of, of any such model like we are, that we have been demonstrating. So this is the first with evidence of sustainability over a period of time. So it is something quite big what we've been able to prove. Um, the difficulty of the business model is that we have to create enough network sales or so-called anchor clients to cross subsidize individual citizen users at less than 30 rand per month. We now know that that's what needs to be done. We know how it needs to happen. The, problem, the issue is that in the next phase of, after five years of experimentation, we've now figured out how to make something like this work. Um, to finish off with, this is just an example. We've been doing a lot of policy advocacy in South Africa and beyond in terms of how to make a model like this work. And this is one example of policy briefs that we've been writing. And last month, out of the blue, we've had this, which is, this is my time is up, in which this that has been put out by the department, national government, it actually speaks directly to the enabling, enabling of community networks, which is a provision of radio frequency spectrum for economic development, showing that we've had also impact on policy as uh, through the work we've been doing. Thank you very much, Chair and colleagues. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Peter. I don't see any questions or comments from attendees. I just have one question for you. In terms of uh, community awareness and education or training, is there any involvement from the government or is there any partnerships with uh, the private sector or how is training and education done um, in that specific case study? So by and large, we've been doing that. The problem is that one organization can't do everything. There's been limited roles of government that the Department of Science Innovation has funded us to understand some of the work as we have had funding from many others. So, um, so government has had little active involvement other than funding. We have been doing a lot of that on our own, but the idea around making this work is to bring on board the appropriate partners to do things like awareness and other types of uh, um, uh, kind of what I call catalyzing the digital ecosystem work. Because Zenzeleni as an entity cannot take care of all of those things. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Pfeiffer. Thank you very much for your insightful presentation. Um, Colleagues and attendees, before I hand over to Dr. Matlina, uh, who is going to close the session or the research week, I want to thank all the presenters for the invaluable input, as well as everyone who attended the session. Um, I think for me, what I was reminded during the course of the week is that research is not only to build knowledge and to facilitate efficient learning, but research is needed to propel humanity forward. And I think our work and your work is definitely not in vain. We have so much to do still in order to see that the SDGs are taking action and that, is that it is implemented efficiently. Thank you so much. I'm handing over to my colleague, Dr. McLeanley. Thank you so much. Dr. McLeany, are you there? Dr. Sinden, um, we lost connectivity for oh, okay, he's back. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
Dr. Madeline, are you there? Thank you. You can go ahead. No wonder you're on mute. Dr. Medlene is just having um, some mic problems. Professor Phillips, would you like to say a few words until you can get the problem sorted, please? Thank you, um, Melody. Yeah, he's working on his, his microphone problems. But I think from my side, I would just like to say a big thank you to all the, all the presenters um, of the session, particularly, but also the the sessions um, in the previously in the in the rest of the week, it was really insightful um, presentations that we've that we've had, and it's it's really nice to see where our institution is in terms of um, putting our research out there and how we align our research with the SDG um, twenty thirty, um, and not just SDG twenty thirty goals, but also the um, Africa Agenda 2063. So from my side, a big thank you to everybody for attending, not only today, but um, the rest of the week as well. Thank you so much, Melody. Sorry, colleagues, hello. We can hear you, Lawando. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, initially, I was not a, a panelist. So I think I experienced some challenges in, 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 in unmuting my, uh, my mic, but that, that has been since uh, sorted. So thank you for, for, for your patience um, while I'm still, I was still trying to sort out my, my challenges. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for sharing your outstanding work uh, and contribution to SDGs. Um, indeed, one can say that there is a paradigm shift at UWC uh, and it's evident that we are more <clears throat> of a socially engaged institution um, reading from all the presentation that have, we've, we've been preview to throughout the week. So the, the, the theme this year um, was UWC's contribution to SDGs agenda 2030. And the purpose uh, was just to celebrate, to share, to explore, to discuss different ideas and, and collaborations that UWC is involved in. And, and, and what this week showed is that uh, higher education institutions have a central role to play in driving or, or progressing towards uh, the sustainable development goals. Um, now more than ever, universities around the world have come to an understanding that they are more are inclined to work with the society to address pertinent issues that are pressing to the society and descend from uh, I, their ivory towers and understand that they belong within the society and they are part of the ecosystem. And their responsibility is to harness, incubate, and ensure that ecosystem becomes successful. So that's one element that um, uh, has been evident uh, through, throughout the week. And, and as the University of the Western Cape, we, we occupy a unique position uh, within the society. We have a broad responsibility around cre creation and dissemination of knowledge. And we're increasing, increasingly as an institution through our IOP, rethinking our role in the modern era and looking to be both more responsive to societal needs and to become agents of change uh, towards solving uh, global challenges and, and one would say also grand challenges. So given this critical role that universities have in ensuring the success of SDGs. Um, we have a, a, a moral imperative 
to embody support for SDGs as part of a social mission and as part of our core functions as higher education institution. Um, lastly, um, I, I, I would like to, to, to thank all our esteemed panelists for this session and the sessions uh, that we've had uh, throughout the week. Um, the participants uh, who ensured a vibrancy in the discussions. I would also like to extend a word of gratitude to, to Prof. Joseph Franz, uh, our DVC Research and Innovation, for creating this platform through the Office of Research and Development under the tutelage of Prof. Phillips. We are truly thankful, Prof. Phillips. Um, it would be unjust also not to mention uh, IA, um, uh, Melody and her team uh, for ensuring that we are able to reach wider audiences audiences within our space. Um, lastly, we also wanted to thank um, the marketing team um, and the organizers behind the event, uh, Maxine, Melody, Justin, we, we truly, truly appreciate your work and your efforts. Um, what I'm hoping for, what we are hoping for as, 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 as the Office of, of Research and Development and in particular, uh, research and innovation. We're hoping that there will be new collaborations that will develop uh, from these discussions. We will engage in research that goes uh, beyond fact-finding machines, but also ensures sustainability, such as, as the Zinzali networks that uh, Prof. Partha spoke about. I'm also hopeful that we'll move from our silos and push for more inclusive, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary uh, approaches to ensure that we will look at these problems uh, uh, through different lenses, and that will ensure and necessitate um, various solutions to, 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 to these problems. So with those words, once again, colleagues, we are grateful and we are indebted to you for making the sixth annual research uh, week a success. Thank you very much.